I'm going to turn that chair in that way. Then we need a line drawn 10 feet away. I'm going to measure a 10 feet distance and perhaps keep another chair there. What I'm going to tell him is, when I ask him to go, he must get up, walk to that chair, turn around, come back and sit down. And as he's doing that, I'm going to time it on my watch. And I'm going to see how long he takes. If he takes less than 10 seconds, perfect. 10 to 12 seconds is great, but if he takes more than 12, that is 13, 14, 15 seconds, as the time increases, we say that his mobility is not as good as it should be. So let me do that now. And as we do that, I'm also going to look for a slow pace. I'm going to look for a loss of balance. I'm going to look for short strides at a shocking game like this. If he has it, I'm going to look for these things as well. But let's do the time up and go test with Mr. Marika and see how long he takes. So that's wonderful. So this is the time the up and go test, right? And as you saw, he did not have a slow tentative pace. He did not appear to have a loss of balance. He definitely did not take short strides with no arm swing. So in other words, mobility-wise, Mr. Manikam is perfectly fine, right? Okay. So if, on the other hand, a patient takes longer than 12 seconds, these are the things that we look for. Why is he taking longer? Does he have a muscle weakness? Is he sarcopenic for some reason? Has he been bedridden for a long time? Has he lost muscle mass? Is he osteoporotic? Is there a vitamin D level that we have? In fact, these days we don't even bother about that. We just give them supplemental vitamin D. Is, does he have osteoarthritis? Is it painful? That's why he's not walking fast. Right? And in his case, he does have osteoarthritis. But obviously, he's not in as much pain as to preclude a 12-second walk. Does he have any CNS disease? Does he have cognitive decline? Does he have a visual impairment he's not able to see? Or a hearing or a vestibular issue? Is he taking any psychotropic medication which is causing him imbalance? These are the things we, we quickly check if the time taken is more than 12 seconds. So these are, like I said, the false risk assessment tool and the tandem stand test. These are two other names that I will leave with you for you to look up at your leisure. So if there is an increased risk of falls, we will be educating him, obviously. We will be giving him exercises for stability. We will look at his medication list. All of you who deal with elderly people, you know that many times it's a long list. Is there something we can eliminate from that? Is there something perhaps leading to his imbalance? All right? We must check his vision and hearing periodically. And of course, we must come to his home and environment as well, which I'll talk about briefly. So, what have we done so far? We are talking about comprehensive geriatric assessment. We are talking about physical status. 
We are saying that this is what the CGA totally encompasses, of which we are doing physical assessment, vision, hearing, and mobility. Of which we said vision is by acuity testing with the smell and start at six meters. Hearing, we can use the whisper test. Falls or mobility risk, we can use the PUG test of time up and go. So far, so good. Okay? Right, let's move to the next aspect. Now, when we look at the mental status of a person, an elderly person, the thing we are all taught are the three Bs delirium, dementia, and depression. Now, delirium and dementia, both of them refer to a a, a little cognitive dysfunction. But the difference is that while delirium is an acute, which is hours, days perhaps, dementia is chronic, progressive, long standing. Right? So the name given, I mean, the name delirium suggests that there is poor attention, incoherent speech, and an altered level of alertness over a short period of time. Right? The key is substantial change or fluctuation in mental status over hours or days. That is when we call it delirium. On the other hand, chronic cognitive decline or dementia is yes, there is a fluency of language, vagueness with dates, tendency to repeat, predilection to dwell excessively on distant events, which happens gradually. But both these things, ultimately we need to assess cognitive function of our elderly patient. Now again, there are many uh, scales that are used to assess cognitive function. The most uh, uh, no well known is the mini mental status exam or the MMSE. Now of course, uh, NIMHAS has developed its own version called the HMSE or the Hindi mental status exam. Right? There are shorter than that. To use an MMSE takes a little time because it scores out of 30 points. There are shorter tests available. One is the Hodgkinson's abbreviated or AMT. And these two questionnaires, the ECAQ, Elderly Cognitive Assessment Questionnaire, and the MINICOG. I'll tell you briefly about the MINICOG, but we will do the ECAQ on Mr. Marito. So the MINICOG has three items to register, which means that we, we first ask the person to remember three words that we give him. For example, it could be book, table, glasses, right? And we say, remember these words, repeat them, remember, I am going to ask you later. So we register those words in the mind. After that, we ask the person to draw a clock. Now this is where those of you who work in primary and community settings know that many of our patients are a little uncomfortable with pen and paper. They are not perhaps literate, they have never written. So this is where the Minicog has a little bit of a problem in some of our settings, where we give a pen and paper and ask the patient to draw a clock face. Now these are examples of clocks that people can draw. Now this is an okay clock. It's got the numbers in the right positions, and we ask them to, to set the clock to 11, 10. Now you may ask why not 12, 15 or 130, but somehow scientific testing has shown that 11, 10 gives the best estimate of separating the hands and keeping them at an angle which you can, you can say is normal or not. So this is a normal clock face. Here the numbers are okay, but it's not at 11, 10. And here some of the numbers are missing, not all the numbers are there. So these are examples of clock face which is not correct, right? So how do we score this mini clock? We say, you remember those three words I told you? Say them again. And each word gets one point. And the correct clock gets two points. And so it's scored out of five. So this is the mini clock test for cognitive assessment. Now the other one which we use somewhat often at our clinical setting is the ECAQ, and this is the one which let me uh, administer to Mr. Manika. This consists of 10 questions which we ask, and let's see how many of them he is able to answer. So I'll use the mic at this time. So, Mr. 
Anikan. Passed with flying colors, 10 out of 10 on the ECAQ, which is very, very, uh, very, very impressive indeed for a 75 year old gentleman to be so sharp with his uh, uh, mental state. So, this is a cognitive assessment screen which we use at the clinic level. It, like you say, again, like I said earlier, do you think this is difficult to do at primary care? It's not. Again, you just have to pull out one, one maybe one sheet which has these questions and administer it to, to your patient, right? So this is a TCAQ. Some things to remember when you administer cognitive screens. Remember that you have to look at the educational level. Like I told you, some of our patients are illiterate. They may find it difficult to use paper and pen. But the MMSE asks you, the patient to copy a diagram. But that I find that some of them find it difficult to do. Now the previous level of functioning the purpose we are doing cognitive testing is to see serially whether there is a change, right? So we document today his ECAQ score is 10 out of 10. Maybe one year later we we'll repeat it and see whether it has changed, right? And of course, language and sensory impairment like uh, vision and hearing. So these are things to remember. If we have abnormal cognitive function, we must look for secondary causes. That is when we refer for a full diagnostic evaluation at secondary or tertiary level, right? And we reassess periodically like I have already said. Delirium, dementia, depression. Now depression, the prevalence of depression in primary care among the elderly ranges from 10 to 25 percent. Now 10 to 25 percent is quite high. Just think about it. Out of every four patients, one. Out of every 10 patients, one. That is what 10% and 25% mean. So, one of the things we use for assessment of depression is what we call the geriatric depression scale or the GDS. Now, the GDS has three versions. One is the long one, the 30 item one. One is a short form, which is the 15 item ones. And one is a very crude screening one, which is the four item one or the GDS four. That's the one which we use most at a clinic setting because it just gives us a quick screen and the likelihood that a person may have depression. So there are four items in the DDS4 which I will now ask him and we will see what he says. The four items are these. Are you basically satisfied with your life? Do you feel that your life is empty? Are you afraid something bad is going to happen to you? Do you feel happy most of the time? Now my language skills are not that great but let me try it. Hello, Dr. Mansar. Hello, sir. Check. 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 Check
I'm requesting Dr. Rock to put it correctly. I'm not confident of my cover ability to translate these four questions, so I'm requesting Dr. Rock to do it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking Dr. Rock to escort Mr. Manikam back to his seat. It's been wonderful having him. Please give him a big hand. As you can see, four simple questions, but they have to be phrased correctly, and the patient has to understand what you're asking. And if all the answers are in the white, now here there's a white and a yellow, the yellow answers, even if one is a yellow answer, in other words, even if one of the four questions indicates that the person might be having depression, that is enough for you to think that you need to assess him further. If, like him, all four answers are in the white category, then you can rule out depressive illness for now. Right? That is how we use the GDS4. Like I said, zero, not depressed, that means all four answers are white. One, uncertain, two to four definitely suggests that he may be having a depressive illness. Now, the sensitivity and specificity of this is 80 percent ish which means they can be a 20% false negative and a 20% false positive also. But it's a useful screen at primary care. Now, if your person screens positive for depression, this is what we need to do. We need to consider reassessment, maybe diagnostic evaluation of the psychiatrist, continue to monitor in primary care. So, thus far, we have talked about the CGA. We have said physical and mental. Physical, we have talked about vision, hearing, mobility and falls. Now, mental status, we have talked about two things, cognitive assessment and the GDS4. All okay so far? Right? I promise I won't take too long after this. Now, the functional status scales, in other words, how a person is functioning, is most commonly the, the way we address it is by using what we call the ADL or activities of daily living scales. We have two broad areas of activities of daily living. One is what we call the physical activities of daily living and the other is the functional, I mean instrumental activities of daily living. So for the physical activity scale, we have two scales. One is a simple one called the CAG scale, which is just a six item scale and the Bartel scale, which is a 10 item scale. So, if you look at the CAG scale, simple six questions, and the way in which I ask our students to remember this, is just think of your elderly person getting up in the morning. When he gets up in the morning, what are the things he has to do over the next, whatever, half an hour? He has to move to the toilet, that's what we call transfer, he has to use the toilet independently. He has to have a bath. He has to dress himself or herself up. He has to eat. And he has to remain free of involuntary urination of fecal movement. 
which is what we call incontinence. So these are six questions that we ask to see whether our patient is independent in these tasks or requires assistance. Those are the two possibilities with the activities of daily living scale. So this is the physical activity scale of cats. The Bartel scale is slightly, slightly more than these six items, where we have uh, additional things like uh, using uh, stairs and grooming. Uh, these are these are the uh, the additional uh, questions in the ten item Bartel scale as compared to the six item cat scale. The instrumental activities of daily living are these. We use what is known as the Lawton's Instrumental Activity Scale. There are, this is how I remember it, three M's, two T's, SHOL. The three M's are money handling, medication, and meals. The two T's are telephone and transport, and the SHOL is shopping, that is in other words, buying things at the shop, housekeeping, that is doing household tasks at home, and taking care of clothes. Right? So these are instrumental activities of daily living, gives an idea as to the functional status of our elderly person. Right? So uh, these, like I said, IADL and PADL. So thus far, we have spoken about the physical assessment, the mental status assessment, the functional status assessment using these scales. Again, to repeat, they are not difficult to use at primary care. And like I told you right in the beginning, you have to set a little time apart to do this. I agree with the crowded OPD, a lot of patients waiting, might be difficult to use. But you remember, you don't have to do all of them at one sitting. You can do one thing today, and the next time you see, you can do another thing. Right? So that's how we deal with comprehensive assessment. The social and environmental status doesn't have a scale, really like the other things. Uh, so what we do is, we just set, ask a set of questions which relate to who looks after you, who are you living with. In your house, are there any clutter? Is there any things on the floor which you might trip and fall over, right? Uh, what is your economic status? Are you covered by insurance of any form? Diet, sleep, physical activity. Are you eligible for the national old age pension scheme? Do you get pension? transportation, communication, social participation. In other words, we're trying to assess how this person fits into his social sphere, right? That's the purpose of the social assessment scale. So if I were to put in conclusion what we have got from the assessment of this gentleman, I would say that medically, he is a hypertensive who's well controlled, he has been offered a diagnosis of osteoarthritis for which he controls using phylum and exercise. He takes one tablet every day. He is one of the fortunate people who doesn't have a long prescription list. Physically, his visual acuity seems to be okay. 6, 9 and 6, 6 in both eyes, though we didn't test him here. His hearing impairment, this says suggestion, I'm sorry, it should say no suggestion of hearing impairment. Though one year, he missed two words. Now that's, that's there in my mind, which means that the next time I see him, I'll probably reassess him for that year. His mobility is good. You saw the time up and go test. He completed it in seven seconds. His risk of fall is low. His cognition is superb. And his depression scale is absolutely fine. He has no symptoms of depressive illness. Functionally, he's independent. This over a, over a conversation, I didn't assess it here, but in conversation, he is independent in the physical activities of daily living. He is also able to do the activities of the instrumental activities of daily living scale. And social and environmental assessment, he's living with his spouse, he's in a good, stable relationship, diet seems to be adequate. He works even now at our rural health center as a health inspector. His economic status is stable. He is not covered under private health insurance, but he's a government servant who's retired. He's receiving state pension. Then domestic environment perhaps is a little cluttered. He uses public transport independently. He's a participant in his village and social affairs. 
Now this is this gentleman in a comprehensive way. Now initially he said he's hypertensive, he has osteoarthritis, treat him, he goes. But there is more to him than that. And that is what this comprehensive assessment aims to do. So I've spoken about two things thus far, just to conclude. I have spoken about the demographics of the elderly, that it's a large population, a growing population, a rural population, a single elderly woman, a heterogeneous population with a high prevalence of morbidity uh, and problem. Then we looked at characteristics of elderly people. The fact that they don't present early, they require a multidisciplinary approach, senior friendly health facilities with a careful consideration of the cost of care. Then we went on to actually do a comprehensive assessment of an individual. And we said that the comprehensive assessment must have at least five domains. Medically, which is what we do normally. Physically, which is vision, hearing and mobility. Mentally, which is cognition, the depression. Functionally, which is the activities of daily living, physical and instrumental. And finally, social and environmentally, as to how the person lives in his social circle. This, in short, is the comprehensive geriatric assessment. Now, before we end, let me, let me read out this poem to you. My eyes are dimming, my hair is grey, my ears are ringing. I can't hear what you say. My heart is weak. My lungs make noise. My knees, they creak. And it's soft, my voice. But my mind is at peace with me and with you. I'm having a lovely day. And so I hope are you. Now, there was a study done in Northern Karnataka which revealed that 19% of the elderly in a rural area when asked, said they are contented, happy, <coughs> and healthy. And I think the challenge that we have at primary care is can we increase that percent? Can we make it more? Can we have more of our elders who are happy, content, and healthy? Let me leave you with that thought, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Over to our MCs. Would you, uh, Rock, do you want to take any questions? Do you have any questions which you would like to ask? I see that the time is now 10.34. I think we are still within normal limits. Yes, sir. I'm your man, sir. I was uh, in the room with uh, Get Up and Go Test. Yes, sir. Was it purposefully that you made the chair turn around that side? Actually, sir, what we do is draw a, a broad red line there. That's what we have in the OPD. Here I placed the chair just as a mark to where he should go. I'm not sure. Correct. Yeah, well, I turned it around because I just wanted it to be a line rather than a place to sit. Thank you, sir. Yes, there's a gentleman there. Right, sir, my question is uh, if, uh, if the elderly is having some cognition problem, cognition problem. What is the next step, sir? Right. Good question, uh, Like I said, we first have to understand whether this is a short duration, acute issue, in which case we would say, is it delirious? Is it a problem which has a root in the immediate circumstances? Is there an infection? Is there an electrolyte problem? Is there something that can explain an acute cognitive lapse? Or is it a chronic problem? Now suppose it's a chronic problem, which is what I think your question is. What do we do next? Well, I would think that that is where we've got to get into how best 
can this person continue to live independently and with the best quality of, the, of life for the longest time? That's the question. So I guess it's at that time that we look for secondary, even chronic cognitive impairment can have secondary causes. We need to check whether his thyroid is okay, vitamin B12, a few other things which may explain chronic cognitive decline. Once we have ruled all that out, and we know that this is probably dementia, then I guess the only way to go is to try to work with the caregiver and see how best that person's physical, I mean that person's independence can, can be maintained for the longest period. <coughs> So it's a question of education, caregiver assessment, counselling, physiotherapy, and uh, a little bit of uh, hand holding, perhaps in the initial phase. But it's very difficult to take care of a person with advanced dementia. But we, that's the way to go. There's no medical intervention in most cases. This is this is the only thing that we have to offer. Actually, I've seen uh, uh, dementia cases they. Prescribe uh, dolipizin, yes. and also some people use paracetamol. Right. Uh, is is there any application, sir? Well, uh, dolipizin we do use, but uh, we must understand that that's not a cure. We don't we don't aim to cure it with that. We just try to delay progression. We try to delay the the, the progression of symptoms, and and not all patients necessarily will even that delay happens. Even though we give donor we find that uh, progression still continues. But it's more to do with how the person is cared for and what happens at home, or how do the caregivers cope with it. That's what we have to focus on more in care of persons with dementia than medication. Thank you. Dr. Park Sarkar, yes, sir. This is for the uh, whatever you said is for the assessment of the geriatric. Yes. I just want to know is there any scale or is there any, anything to assess the caregivers? Caregivers' knowledge about their own, uh, uh, the geriatric people. Thank you. That's a good one. Actually, we had a, one of our postgraduate students, Dr. Marshaki, do a study on assessment of caregiver burden in persons with chronic disease who are dependent. So assessment of the caregiver, we have assessed burden of care. That is how difficult they are finding it and how they are coping with it. But their knowledge about the, the condition itself, etc., they wouldn't be standard skills. But uh, I would, all I can say is I think that's a very important area where we work with the caregiver, see if the caregiver has understood where this person is and what the future course of this person's life will be. So, there is one scale called the Zarek Burden Interview, ZBI, which is the one we use for caregiver burden assessment. But uh, apart from that, I think it's left to the interaction between the uh, doctor, the provider, and the caregiver. Wonderful. Excellent. Anything else? If not, Dr. Rock, back to you guys. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.